Thank you again for joining the Rose Responsibilities and Partnership session. My name is April L. Harrison, and I'm a Grants Management Specialist at NIDCR. And I'm serving as your moderator for the next 45 minutes. Today's format includes a short presentation followed by a Q&A with our presenters. During the Q&A, you can answer questions in the Q&A box. Let's get started. Next slide. Have you ever wondered who do I turn to when I need to help when I need help or advice from the NIH? Next slide. Well, today you came to the right place as we have three key experts from the extramural team, Dr. Ashley Lane from Scientific Review, Dr. Amanda Melio from Program, and Ms. Susan Mavi from Grants Management, who are all going to walk you through their roles, responsibilities, and how they can help you navigate the grants management system. Your first presenter today is Dr. Ashley Lane. Next slide. Thank you, April, for that introduction. So if you take a look at the schematic on the left-hand side of your screen, it depicts the life cycle, the grant life cycle. Applicants first plan and then plan their um, scientific submission. Then they find a corresponding funding opportunity announcement. Once they do so, they are then eligible to apply and submit their grant to the NIH. As a scientific review officer, I am involved with the receive and refer application component as well as the review application process. At the Center for Scientific Review, otherwise known as CSR, study sections are managed by scientific review officers, otherwise known as SROs. An SRO is a doctoral level professionals whose scientific background is closely in line to the focus of the study section. The SRO manages the meeting conflicts, prepares the summary statements, and also provides information to the different institutes and centers regarding the proceedings of the review outcome. Each CSR study section has about 12 to 25 regular members who are from the scientific community, and temporary members are recruited as needed. Each um, study section reviews approximately 60 to 100 applications um, for each meeting. Now, as a scientific review officer, I typically, typically get questions regarding, you know, when should I contact an SRO? What exactly is your role? So I briefly wanted to go over that. So before you're, you submit your application or as you're preparing your application, and you have questions regarding whether a particular institute or center is appropriate for your application, that's when you contact a program officer. Now, if you have questions regarding what study section to submit your application to be reviewed at, that's when you contact a scientific review officer. You can find contact information for program officers as well as scientific review officers at the bottom of the funding opportunity announcements that you wish to apply under. Now, after you submit your application, all questions are then all then are referred to your scientific review officer. You can find your assigned scientific review officer's contact information located within ERA Commons. Typically, after you submit your application, applicants want to submit post post submission materials, and you also submit those to your scientific review officer. Now, once the review is completed and you have received your summary statement, that will be at that point, you then refer any questions to your assigned program officer. You will be able to see who your assigned program officer is once on the left, if you look at the upper left hand corner of the first page of your summary statement. Now, before I hand over the baton, I want to briefly go over ways that you can find different scientific review officers' contact information. So if you go to the home page of the Sci Sci Center for Scientific Review, and then you click on study sections, you will see various study sections within various um, different areas of science. So if you sift through those um, different study sections and click the particular link that you're interested in, you will see the email address and telephone number of the scientific review officer responsible for that study section. Another way is to also use the assistant referral tool. This tool allows you to 
copy and paste your AIMS page, and then using artificial intelligence, um, CSR will recommend different study sections, and you will be able to click on those different links and get the email address as well as the telephone number for those recommended study of the email address and telephone number of the SRO for those recommended study sections. And lastly, I briefly want to draw your attention to study section rosters. All rosters are available publicly at the link below. And that's another way that you can determine, oh, okay, well, a lot of people in my area, in my scientific area, are on this roster. So maybe I should target my study section, my um, application to this particular study section. So that's another method. So now I want to hand over the baton to a program officer, Dr. Amanda Melillo. Amanda? Hi. Thank you, Dr. Lane. So first, as we get started, I have a little poll question for you. In the fundamental session um, previous to this one, you've already heard a little bit about what program officers do. So now I'd like to know how many of you know who your program officer is. We could bring the poll question up. Okay, great. So about about a third of people know who their program officer is, and um, another third maybe haven't applied yet or um, aren't yet funded. So only a small percentage are seem to have know who the, do not know who their program officer is. So that's good. That is good to know. So um, this will help for you guys and also for people that have not yet applied. So next slide, please. So if for the role of a program officer, going back to the grant life cycle, um, you may also hear the word PO for short, short, which just stands for program officer. Uh, we can be involved with many different phases of the grant life cycle. So for example, in the planning phase of your grant, um, program officers can be involved in that stage, which I'll get to on the next slide. Um, for funding opportunities, program officers um, actually develop funding opportunity announcements. You may also see those called FOAs, for short for funding opportunity announcements. This could also be known as initiative development. So program officers are very involved in that um, process. And then the application goes through for, through review as uh, Dr. Lane already went over. So then if the application is selected for an award, this is part of what program officers also do. So we make recommendations for applications to be considered for an award by the um, Institute director. And then finally, in managing the grant award, POs can provide programmatic, scientific and or technical guidance and that can actually occur both pre and post award. And we also can manage, um, manage the oversight of a grant after it's been awarded, um, including monitoring the research progress, such as most, most grants, not um, all, depends on the type of grant, but have research uh, performance progress reports, also known as RPPRs. And POs um, do read these reports carefully and uh, assess the progress of the grant each year. So next slide, please. So when should you contact your program officer? So before you submit your application, you can discuss um, the application topics if they're relevant for that particular IC. You can also discuss with your program officers the appropriate funding opportunity announcement or what type of grant, what type of grant mechanism to apply for, for example, an R21 or an R01. Program officers can help with those questions right before you submit. They can also help provide guidance on submitting a large budget, such as a grant that's over 500K in direct costs. This is actually required that you um, contact your program officer before submitting a grant like type like that, dep dependent on the um, funding opportunity announcement you choose. And they also can provide guidance with application preparation. So after that, your application goes through review and you receive a summary statement, 
then you can contact your program officer to discuss the next steps, um, ask questions about NIH policies, and program officers can help with those steps. So a summary statement is the um, document you get back after an application goes to review. And so it goes through review, it's peer reviewed, and then you get a written statement back um, to yourself to go through and read um, the comments from the reviewers to understand what concerns, what they liked about the review, what concerns they might have. So during the award, um, so once an award is made, then you can contact your program officer to discuss uh, natural disasters or other emergencies that might affect the progress of award. You could just contact your program officer, officer to discuss other supplement opportunities. So there's sometimes opportunities to get supplemental funds for your award. Um, you can also contact program about questions for prior, prior approvals and changes to your award. And also just to discuss the funded, um, the progress of your funded award. And then finally, after the award, you would um, can contact your program officer to share publications or other things that may have come out of the award. And also, if you plan on submitting a renewal application, so basically continuing that line of research with another application, program officers can help walk you through that process as well. So now I'm going to... Um, pass the ton over to Susan so she can discuss the grants management perspective. Thank you, Amanda. The role of the grants management branch is to make the award and manage the award. Next slide, please. Let's first start with the roles of the grants Chief Grants Management Officer and the Grants Management Specialist. The GMO is like the police officer for the, for the grants department. It's their responsibility for completion of business management requirements and oversee making sure all awards comply are complying with federal regulations. The GMS acts as an agent for the GMO. Next slide, please. As an agent for the GMO, we assure compliance with federal laws and NIH policies and procedures. We analyze grant applications prior to the award and get all the required documentation necessary to prepare your award for the GMO release. We provide technical assistance, interprets NIH policies and institute procedures. We review and respond to grantee prior approval requests. And we assure that all documentation of the official grant file Sometimes the GMS will have to work with their GMO to get special exception, um, like a third no cost extension would need an additional authority from our chief GMO. Next slide, please. The GMO, as I mentioned, they are responsible for the completion of business management requirements. They evaluate applications for administrative content and compliance with policy interpret grants administration policies, monitors and a grant administrative and fiscal aspects, assures compliance with federal laws and NIH administrative policies and procedures. The GMO is the NIH official authorized to obligate the NIH to the expenditure of funds or to change funding amounts, budget project period dates, or other terms and conditions on the grant award. Next slide, please. When would you contact your grants manager specialist? You will contact us for all pre-award requests, our just-in-time process. If there's a delay in completing any paperwork required to issue your award, to discuss financial or grants administrative issues, such as budget questions, adding a foreign component, Questions about your budget or other support on your grant. Questions about any terms and conditions on your notice of award. Clarification of NIH rules and policies and also for interpretation of grants policies. Next slide, please. 
So when would you want to contact your grants specialist? You'll want to contact us for any action that requires prior approval. And some of the common prior approvals are a change in scope, reducing principal investigator effort by 25% or more, going from a single PI to a multi-PI, carryover of unobligated funds from a previous budget period to a subsequent budget period, and only when your automatic carry, carryover is not authorized as a term and condition on the notice of award, or if executing any carryover would cause some type of change in scope. And you want to contact us with any issues your business office does not handle or cannot advise on. Next slide, please. Uh, the next few slides are to provide some helpful resources. Need a reminder or quick links to understanding staff roles or contacts for the various institutes or centers, even ERA help desk? Check out NIH grants page, grants.nih.gov slash help. There are links with more policies, application guides, frequently asked questions, and a chat box that will also help you direct you in the right place for resources. Next slide, please. The NIH Grants homepage, grants.nih.gov, provides links to NIH policies and guidance on the entire grants process, including COVID information, electronic submission, applications, forms, and instructions, how your application is reviewed, all about grants podcasts, system of award management, SAM registration, policy on resubmission applications, who can apply for funding, grant writing advice and sample application, and grantee policies. In addition, many of the NIH institutes and centers provide additional details to supplement this information with samples and additional information to help provide clarity. Next slide, please. Where to find our, our, the contact information for your grants manager? You can find it in the, in the FOIA, the FOA, refer to the grants, con, grants contact section or after the application was submitted, you can look in ERA. And once it was awarded, you can also find our information on the NOAA. There's also some links here for clinical research resources, as well as the over 500K grant policy process. Next slide, please. And here are some frequently encountered acronyms. NOA is Notice of Award, FFR will be your Federal Financial Report, OPERA is the Office of Policy for Extramural Research Administration, CSR, as you heard, is Center for Scientific Review, RPG would be Research Project Grant, RFA would be the Request for Application, a PA would be a Program Announcement, FOA is a funding opportunity announcement, and IC is the Institute Center. So visit the grants.gov website for a complete list of the NIH acronym list and glossary. Thank you, and now I'll turn it back over to April. Hello, thank you for your participation today. So now we're gonna get started with a few questions. The first question I have is directed towards you, Susan, and it asks, do we need prior approval for rebudgeting between categories? Um, you, it depends. You can rebudget within as long as it's not 25% or more, but there are some grants that don't allow for certain rebudgeting, whether it's a fellowship or in a training grant, some of those categories who are not allowed to rebudget. Thank you. The next question I have is, okay, Amanda, I'm getting a lot of questions about what is the best way to contact your program officer? Yeah, so um, and if you're if it's before you submit an application, 
you can always go to the NIH reporter website and use their matchmaker tool. So that's just reporter.nih.gov and you'll see a matchmaker tool there. And that tool will allow you to put in your abstract or aims, basically the type of research you're doing. And it will come up with a list of POs that are matched at some level to um, the area of science. So you can find a PO that way. So if you email a PO, I saw this question come up too, and no one gets back to you right away, you know, you may wanna just find another PO on that list because all those POs may be um, somewhat aligned with the area of science you're looking into. And so you can always um, email someone else, another PO, the similar question to um, see if may maybe the research is better aligned with their institute or their program. So otherwise it's okay to always send another email and, and ask if you haven't heard back from them in, in a few days or a week, always, you know, follow up. We get a lot of emails. Okay. The next question is for you, Ashley. How are study sections assigned by NIH? That's a great question. So you have the option to suggest study sections where you want your application to go to. And you can do so using the assignment request form. And the assignment request form allows you to enter um, in institutes and centers, which may be interested in funding your application. And you can also suggest study sections. Now, please note, just because you enter a study section where you want your application to re be reviewed, it is not guaranteed. It's just a suggestion. Another April, I'm seeing another question that's very similar to review. Okay. Can I go ahead and answer it? Sure, thank you. So I see that someone also wanted me to give examples of post-submission materials. So many FOAs, well, many FOAs allow you to submit post-submission materials up to 30 days before the review meeting. And examples of post-submission materials include, maybe you're including um, you got a publication that was recently accepted and you want to let the panel know this. Or maybe you're having a change in the contact PI and you need to let them know that. Right now, because of COVID, we're allowing applicants to submit up to one page of preliminary data. So there's a list of different acceptable materials of post-submission. If you Google post-submission materials in NIH, you will see a um, notice that will give you a list of all the acceptable post-submission post materials. And again, those are submitted directly to your SRO. Thank you, Ashley. Um, the next question is, Susan, is for you. So it's more um, in regards to the, rebud the rebudgeting. It says that um, if it's less than 25%, is no approval needed. So can you clarify that? Yes, as long as your rebudget is within 25% and it does not affect changing the scope of the work, you are allowed to rebudget. But like I mentioned before, there are certain mechanisms that don't allow that as far as like a fellowship or a training grant they do have specific categories that you are not allowed to rebudget in or out of. Thank you, Susan. Okay, so Amanda, what, um, another question that I'm seeing frequently is what should an applicant do if they only see one PO listed and they're not getting back to them? So if, um, you know, you, I already have an application submitted and you see what your who your PO is on your summary statement post review and you send an email you haven't heard back. I'd first just start by um, sending another email, um, you know, maybe not the next day, but a few days or a week later, if you're not hearing back, you can always follow up. If you're still not hearing back, you could always, you know, try to find, you um, a PO in that branch or maybe the branch chief for that branch and just reach out and ask the question again. You know, sometimes people just miss email. There may be a reason why, why they weren't able to get back to you, but um, we're always trying to respond in, in a timely manner. Okay. Also, Amanda, could you um, briefly describe the difference between an RFA and a program announcement, if there is any? Oh, yeah. So, uh, a PA is 
Um, it could be the parent announcement, which I mean by parent, it means it's an unsolicited application, basically. We're not, NIH isn't soliciting it in a particular area of science. Um, that's what the parent FOA is, and that's a, a, a program announcement, PA. And then an RFA is an area that the Institute is um, soliciting for a response. So if there's some gap area that's been identified, an institute may put out an RFA to um, have applications come in in that particular area of science. And for RFAs, um, money is typically set aside to fund applications that are submitted through that RFA. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Okay, this is another question, Amanda, for you. Are PO specific for a particular ASCII or can one PO span two ASCIs? So it is, the POs are, are assigned from, based on the IAC, based on the institute, that's the IAC. So for um, example, if you submit an application and it goes to the Dental Institute, NIDCR, then an NIDCR program director would be assigned to that application. Um, so anytime you're submitting an application to an NIH institute, the program officer will be assigned from that particular institute. There are a few cases where this could be a little bit different, where if you submit to like an um, common fund initiative that comes out of the office of the director, for example, then your program officer may be at any of the institutes because they're part of that common fund working group. Okay, thank you. So this is a question for pretty much any of you. Um, someone wants to know if there is um, a Green Lab sustainability program for extramural. They said they saw information about intramural for NIH, but not extramural. No one's aware. I haven't seen anything. Okay. No, but thank you. Thank you for bringing that. Yeah. So we'll take that back and we'll find out more information about that. But thank you for bringing that um, question up. April, can I answer a review, yes. review, review related question? Absolutely. So one of the questions I see, um, the person wants to know, are summary statements available for rejected applications? So by rejected, I think the person is um, referring to non-discussed applications. So whether your application is discussed or um, not discussed, your summary statement should be released within 30 days after the review. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Let's see, I'm trying to say something else that haven't went through. While you're going through it, can I answer another review related question? Sure, absolutely. All right. So the question is, it seems like some applications are mismatched for the study section and the members. Is there any way to question or modify the study section assignment? I always suggest that applicants make sure that they are constantly checking their ERA Commons profile to see when their application is matched to a study section. And if they don't think that it's a good fit, please, please, please contact your SRO immediately and let them know that you want a different study section. It always helps to let us know what study section you want to go to so that we can do things on the back end. Now, you may not get the reassignment, but it's always helpful if you let your SRO know that you th think that there's a mismatch and you let us know where you would like to go to instead, as soon as possible. Thank you, Ashley. Amanda, can you answer um, when a PI has a K, when is the best time to start applying for our, for our grant, our mechanism? So that's a little bit dependent on what type of um, K they're talking K. about, but I'm assuming I'll assume that's a K99, um, and then that would transition to your R00. If that's the case that they're asking about, you know, I think that applying um, once you have enough, it, this can be true for any case, but once for any time you're applying for an R01, you just want to make sure that you have enough preliminary data 
in that um, application to really support your hypotheses that you're putting forward so that the reviewers um, okay the, re the reviewers can put enough um, thought into that and then also it just to keep in mind that it takes nine months from review to award actually that could be on the short end it could even take longer so you just always want to plan ahead this is also a time you can reach out to your PO when you're thinking about it and they can help walk you through those timelines and um, the best applications dates to submit. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Susan, can you talk to us some about the carryover process? Uh, well, is there anything specific about the carryover process? So what would happen? I think they you... were more in line of the time frame. So maybe you could tell them um, when they would typically submit a carryover and um, I maybe talk a little bit about SNAP versus non-SNAP and why um, they don't have automatic, automatic carryover and have to submit um, prior approval carryover. Okay, so like I mentioned, if you if your grant is under SNAP, you do not need a prior approval to carry over funds. Um, when your grant is not SNAP, a term will be on there that you need grants management approval for the carryover. You will have to fill up your FFR would have to be submitted and approved by OFM before the request can come to us. And what you would do is submit a package to us that has your FFR, the balance, and a spend down plan as to how you're going to use that money and a justification as to why the money is left over and how you're gonna use it in the next segment. Once you submit all that to us, we work with the program officer. And if we approve the carryover, you will get a revised NOAA with the carryover money in the NOAA, and there were a term beyond. There will be a term on the notice of award explaining the cost and the, what the carryover is for. Okay, great, thank you. So Susan, another you question um, that's related. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask Susan to explain what SNAP is. SNAP is the streamline. And they do not, like I said, you don't have the carryover. It, SNAP does have carryover authority. Okay, so um, the next question is, can you elaborate on Susan on the change of scope and when they should notify their GMS if it's a change in scope? A change in scope for regarding a carryover or just a change in scope? No, it's just a change in scope in general from the question. Yes. Um, if there is any change in scope, you would contact us and then we would actually go back with program because that's a more scientific area as far as making sure that that is within the scope. Um, and once they approve what you're requesting to do, then the official approval will come from the grants department. Okay, so this is another question I think, Amanda, you probably would be able to answer. In addition to FLAs, are there any funding um, that is open for applications on an ongoing basis without an announcement? Could you repeat the end of that question if there's... Oh, sure. Um, I said that... Um, other than the ongoing announcements, are there other, it says in addition to FOAs, are there any funding that um, that's open for applications on, on an ongoing basis without being, without being an announcement? So any type of funding that the NIH will be putting out has some type of announcement. There, there are some types of funding mechanisms that the NIH uses that don't come through FOAs or funding opportunity announcements, such as um, some come through for the like other transaction authorities is a newer mechanism that's been used by NIH, which comes through a um, research. It, it's a similar to an FOA, it's just slightly different, but there'll always be some type of announcement out there that will have a call for applications. So I don't know if that's exactly answering the question. I also just want to clarify 
I think I wasn't um, thinking when I asked, answered the last question. I think I said that there was um, nine months between review to award. I meant to say nine months between application. So when you submit the application to the potential award, that's the nine month period, um, but it could even be longer than that. Okay. Did any of you see any other things that you may have wanted to answer? I'm trying to go through and go through ones that um, I don't think we've touched on. Um, I can answer one more here. Okay. It says, sure, go if, ahead, Amanda. Um, if a PO does not participate in study section, does not have a say in proposals, the SRO and the panel review suggests for funding, then what's the benefit of discussing with the PO before submission? Is there a guarantee that the PO will even be assigned to your application? So it's it, the you want to discuss prior to submission with your PO to make sure that the application is an appropriate fit for the institute, not the study section. So I think that's just a little clarity there. So especially if it's in response to a particular funding opportunity announcement that comes out from one institute, you want to make sure that whatever idea you have that you're going to put in fits. Because if you submit an application to a, to a particular funding opportunity announcement, that's not a general one and all ICE in a the appropriate IC is not signed on, then your application could get withdrawn without review. So you always want to just check in on that prior to application. Okay, the next question says, if the PO does not participate in the study section, does not have a say in the proposal, SRA, SRO and panel review session just for funding. Answer that's that the one. one I just did. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Okay, so the next question is, um, they, Susan, they said you got cut off when you were talking about SNAP. So can you talk about SNAP again? Um, the SNAP is the streamlined process. They do, they do have automatic carryover. So I'll just say st SNAP stands for Streamlined Non-Competing Award Process. That's what Sorry, the, thank you, Amanda. Sorry, and, thank you. Um, it's, it's just um, applied to certain types of awards, um, like, like as Susan had said. Right. So normally larger awards, um, I am a specialist too, but I'm trying to like, man, um, the questions, I would just like to plug in that normally the larger awards are the ones that are non-SNAP. So those are your P50, your um, cooperative agreement. So use or other large research um, mechanisms such as R35. Also, um, fellowships are also um, not SNAP awards, but typically R01s are um, SNAP awards and um, Ks, stuff like that. So, um, okay, people are keep asking that question. I can answer another. So this okay, is go ahead. contact for the next step for an application that has gone through council review since August, but has been pending administrative review in my ERA comments. Um, so you would contact your PO for that. Um, if you still don't hear back, like I said previously, just um, try to reach out again. Okay. So the next question says, um, are study sections for training awards differently from other study sections, Ashley? So by different, they're different because they're reviewing fellowship applications versus R01 applications. The panels are constructed in the same manner. So of course you have experts in your field. Um, like I said, like I mentioned before, R01s and R21s are um, reviewed separately than fellowship. So F31s, F32s, KO1s, and you know K99s, those are reviewed together in a fellowship panel. Usually all F awards are discussed. So um, F awards usually aren't triaged. Okay, well, can either um, Ashley or you, Amanda, talk about um, one of the applicants is saying that they submitted um, an application for one IC, but it ended up in another IC, and now their program officer is completely different. It's asking, they're asking, what should they do? 
I would recommend that when they contact the PO that they were in contact with, and also reach out to the Division of Receipt and Referral at NIH, because they assign the institutes and centers when applications are initially submitted to NIH, and they should be able to help them. That is the Division of Receipt and Referral at NIH. Okay. Okay, so now we actually have um, less than five minutes left in the presentation. So if any of you want to um, answer a last question, you can go ahead and do so before I end out this session. Okay. Sure. Um, one question here asked if there's a difference between a PD and a PO. A PD is a program director, PO, program officer. Uh, no. Some institutes just call them program directors and some say program officers, yeah. but the same. I see, an I see it one of the questions, they say, why does an application not get discussed? So as I mentioned before, study sections usually get between 60 and 100 applications. And typically we discuss the top 50% of applications. So if the preliminary score isn't within the first, the top half, then we do not discuss the bottom half. But you will still get a summary statement. So regardless of whether or not your application was discussed or not, you will get a summary statement to let you know um, the evaluation from your assigned reviewers. Okay. Thank you presenters and participants for this informative session. If you have any additional questions, please visit our exhibit hall booth for chats and one-on-one -on -one opportunities. You can always find contact information in the help section at grants.nih.gov site. Your feedback is very important to us. Please take a moment to let us know what you thought by clicking the session feedback button located within the description and presenters on the auditorium list of the session. When you are completely done with the seminar, please also complete the overall survey form in the navigation bar at the top of the page. Thanks again and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.